Hey guys. Hi. Hello, everybody. <laughs> it's great to see you all. Uh, surprise, I'm not Lee Lewis. <laughs> my name is Ari Polani. Oh, Lee Lewis is up the back. Uh, my name is Ari Polani. I'm one of the producers at Queensland Theatre, and I'm really excited to meet you all and chat further about this work in the foyer. Um, please, with all of these amazing rock stars on stage, resist the urge for photos and film. You'll be able to chat to them all uh, along the way, but it's an absolute joy to meet you and discuss this creative excellence on stage tonight. Let's give it up for the Viet Gong crew and cast. <laughs> Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and the waterways that we work and gather on, the Yagara and Turrbal peoples and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and extend that to all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Although we love being at the Billy Brown Theatre just down the way, it's an absolute pleasure to come here to this beautiful space beside the river. All right. So, let me look at my notes. <laughs> we are here to discuss Viet Gone by Kui Nguyen, Directed by co-directors Nop Farn and Dan Evans. Proudly, yes. <laughs> Proudly supported by our Landmark Productions Fund. Uh, Brisbane audiences know these two names. You are familiar with them. But to combine them together is a magical act. <laughs> uh, We'll hear more about these fine people, but quickly, let's just go down the line. So everyone, can you introduce yourselves, your name and your role on Viet Gone? Oh, hi, I'm Bernie Tanhays, the lighting designer. I'm Nevin Howell, projection designer. Uh, I'm Mike Wilmot, um, sound design composition. I'm Bridget O'Brien, I'm the assistant stage manager. I'm Christina Smith, set and costume designer. Hello, my name is Daniel Evans, but you can call me Dan, and I'm one of the co-directors of Viet Gone. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Ngop Phan. I'm one of the co-directors and uh, one of the actors in the cast. Show. I play Hung Tu, American girl, American... No, a Asian girl, American girl, translator, hippie girl. Hi everyone, my name's Christy and I'm an actor and I'm playing Tong in Viet Gone. Hi everyone, my name is Hugh Lung and I'm playing the role of the playwright, Queen Nguyen. Hi everyone, I'm Al Chinabella, I'm one of the cast, I play Nyan and Quay. G'day guys, my name's Will and I play Quang. Uh, hey everyone, my name is PJ, um, I'm one of the actors and I play the roles of um, American, guy. American guy, Asian guy, uh, hippie and Zai, 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 Bobby. Zai, Zai. Um, Bobby. 
Captain Chambers, redneck biker. Uh, that's it. That's it. And dancer. <laughs> Hi, my name's Yanni, and I am the stage manager of Vietcon. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Now, I hope you took notes and uh, wrote down who everyone's playing. There's going to be a quiz at the end. Uh, now, Viet Gone, it's a semi-autobiographical account of American playwright Queen Nguyen's parents. Helicopter pilot Quang, played by Will, and bold and brave Tong, by Christy, have both narrowly escaped the fall of Saigon and the end of the war in Vietnam, 1975, a historic moment etched in our living and collective memories. Arriving at the refugee camp of Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, Arkansas, although, Dan, you had a moment with Arkansas, maybe in Arkansas. <laughs> Sorry to call you out in front of everyone. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> the two find themselves traveling in different directions. Quang wanting to return home to Vietnam and Tong looking to make a fresh start in the land of opportunity. Alongside them are a collection of memorable characters. We had playwright, best friend Nan, uh, Quay. Uh, we've got love interests galore. You will find Tong kissing a few people. Uh, wait and see. <laughs> uh, and a lot of these characters will make more sense once you see it, when you hear American guy or Asian girl, uh, redneck, uh, biker is pretty self-explanatory. Um, you will discover them. Uh, and in addition, not fun taking the stage to all of those characters as well. There's action and daring. There's song and hip-hop. One of the best playlists in town. And at the heart of it, there's a love story that spans continents and generations. Exciting, right? Good. So... To kick off, let's ask some questions of our beautiful folks. We're going to start with our co-directors. Dan and Nop, can you share with us what your journey with Vietgon has been? Because there has been floods, plague, pestilence, but now we're here. Hello, everyone. Well, this work, how amazing. It was meant to be on in... 2022, and um, it was to be directed by um, artistic director Lee Lewis, and then of course we had flood, plague, crickets, locusts, the works, um, and it was moved um, into um, the following year. Um, and then Lee kind of said to me, um, I'm thinking of blowing up the it gone out of the Bill Brown into the playhouse and how would you feel about directing it? And I went, ooh, ooh. <laughs> because it, the work is quite large and it moves quite fast. Um, it's, it, it's big and it's very much worthy of this space. Um, and I said, absolutely. Um, I don't think I want to do it alone. And then um, I kind of approached Nop because Nop was in it at the time. And I said, Nop, I would love to work with a co-director on this. Who's someone in Australia who you think would be an amazing person to work with? And then she listed some names and then lots of names. And then I kind of let the line go dead for a bit. And I went, how about you? <laughs> do you want to do this with me? Um, and Nop and I have been close friends for a long time. So um, it's um, we kind of started talking about what it is and what it could be. And as I heard Nop talk about why it's important and um, her connection to the story, I was like, there's no one else I want to do this with. And I was like, I can bring the theatrical trickery and I can help um, make it big and bold and beautiful, but not you're going to give it its beautiful, wonderful heart. And that's been the case, I think. Um, that's where we are now. And so we kind of I be began on this journey. And it's funny, oh, what, a what a journey. <laughs> and I said to Lee on the weekend, actually, I was like, I think... Um, Sometimes plays arrive. You're given a play for a reason, and I think the reason I've been given this play, or why it's come into my cosmic orbit, is to meet and to work with one of my best friends, but also to work with these amazing, amazing cast members, some of whom are gracing the stage this size for the first time. Ooh, <laughs> scary, um, <laughs> but great, exciting, and so it's been um, a real, real roller coaster ride and lots of fun. Uh, no, there has been flow charts. There has been Venn diagrams. How are we going to do this? Who's taking care of what? 
How have you arrived at this collaboration? What's working? Where, hey, take us into the rehearsal room. Well, um, first and foremost, thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, for Dan and I, it was really important that we uh, found a process that worked for both of us. And we both established that we come from different worlds. Dan, this is my first directing debut, main stage debut, and Dan's had a plethora of experience. And so, um, just, you know, growing up with different cultures and different um, artistic backgrounds, we decided to kind of use that as a philosophy for the work. Um, and also, um, yeah, just our approach to uh, how we are going to create together and what our responsibilities were. So, as Dan mentioned, there was like the staging component and then there's the um, actor well-being and the heart of the piece and uh, the cultural consultancy component and just kind of using our forces for good and um, seeing how we could best use our um, strengths and, um, yeah, create some synergy there. Well, from what I have seen thus far, the strengths and synergy are there. I am so excited to share this with you, as we all are. Um, we had a glimpse into the rehearsal room for the first 20 minutes of the show uh, late last week. And there were people leaving stunned. There is so much going on, but I want to head over to Christina. Christina Smith our set and costume designer. We also have Nat Reiner, who is our uh, associate costume, our costume associate. But Christina, what do we see behind us and what are we yet to see? Because there is a big, big component to this. Yeah, you, you don't see much behind me at the moment. <laughs> we're, we're on, actually. We're, we're actually sitting on one of the big components, which is um, the... I can't remember the size of this revolver. I want to say 11 metres. Something like 11 metres. I'm getting my shows confused. <laughs> this is what happens. Um, but there's a very big component um, coming in tomorrow. I don't know. Am I, am I allowed to say? Do I say? Do I spot? I'm gonna do Somewhere it. the amazing Dan Madison behind us is looking at a, his schedule and knows exactly when it's about to arrive. Exactly. Likely tomorrow or the next couple of days. Absolutely. Um, uh, in terms of, I guess, how do I, how do I describe it? How we got there. But... Um, on this revolve is we decided through, and it was quite a process with um, Knock and Dan. Yeah, we literally went through, I've got a photograph of a bin full of designs that we went through over a series of creative developments, trying to figure out actually how to really um, provide a space to tell the story and to tell the story in a way uh, in which it will flow. Uh, and also to try and evoke is an incredibly uh, different amount of landscapes. We are talking um, Saigon in 1975, um, highways in Arkansas right through to California, refugee camps. Um, but the one thing that we talked about was that it was a very um, uh, transient space. You don't really lock anywhere for any particular amount of time, which made it um, quite tricky, I think, to find what the motif was. Um, and ultimately, what we've done, and what you will see on this stage, um, is a really, a, we've been calling it a, kind of like a monolith structure, but it's a highway billboard. Um, it's quite large, and in fact, we were just looking, I'm excited to, I'm so excited to see it oh, tomorrow. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I think so, Dan, is Dan, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it will fit. Um, but actually, it's actually, uh, uh, it really is the width of this revolve, and as you can see, our revolve comes right out to here. So the structure's coming out to you in the audience, actually, as it comes around. But what the structure allows us is a, it's a motif of um, the idea of a journey or a travel, the idea of pursuing a dream or an ideal with the idea of the advertising, provides us a projection surface, which is you know, my colleague here, Nevin, might talk about. Um, and it also provides a, a playground space in which um, the cast, uh, along with Bernie and Mike, will transform it into all the different um, locations. And then there are some other fun bits and pieces, maybe a little bit of sparkle at some point. But that's what you will see 
when you come. Amazing. Uh, moving down the line, I would also like to... Uh, well, actually, our technical creatives have been doing a bit of magic in uh, our Diane Salento studio uh, back at home, Queensland Theatre, where they have been pre-visualising this whole thing in 3D. There's, like, screens set up. We see the revolve revolving. We see Nevin's beautiful projection work happening. We hear Mike Wilmot's amazing sound. Like, it is all... There is so much work that is occurring before we even enter into this space. Um, Bernie, can you kind of talk us through a bit of that and then how, like, light is going to shape our experience inside of VietCon? Sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, so as you mentioned, we've been, we've been pre-visualising the show in 3D, which um, is a, you know, relatively recent technology of the last sort of... Um, you know, five to ten years, I guess. Uh, and it, what, it, what it does is enable us to achieve a much higher level of production in, in the same amount of time um, when we're plotting lighting cues and tricky, um, you know, especially on revolves and things, you know, we'd, we'd normally kind of have to sit in the theatre and then work it out. And um, It also enables a certain um, creative space when, when you're doing it, um, you know, when you're, when you're not doing it under pressure in the... In the theatre, and there's you know there's whole whole armies of people and actors and directors and crew standing around waiting for you to do your work, do your work because as lighting designer and um, you know projection and uh, and, and audio um, inevitably we go last so we you know we, we don't see our work and, until it's um, until we're in here and, and, and we're actually working on it and what this does is um, really uh, enable uh, you know a certain amount of freedom and, and sort of creative leverage we can we can have on a piece which we wouldn't have in, in such a short time. Great. Um, I might need Dan and Nop to, uh, if there's any spoilers that you hear us approaching, if you can give us like a buzzer sound to avoid. Uh, Bernie, you have uh, done a headlamp on a certain, am I allowed to mention it? Motorcycle that is in the show. There is a motorcycle death race. Uh, a fight that occurs on stage, as all of you motorcycle enthusiasts might be familiar with uh, from your Saturday rides. Um, but, Bernie, how has that been and, like, translating what we all think occurs up above us in and around further around the stage? Um, I think, you know, as lighting designers, we always try and bring elements of, you know, everyday life and uh, lighting elements of everyday life to... The stage because it helps us ground, it helps us understand it and connect with what's going on and visually and, and what we see. Um, and in this instance, you know, there's, there's a motorbike um, in, in the play and, uh, you know, we've very clever team at QT, in the QT technical department have, have made it work wirelessly on remote control and change colour. So, <laughs> we're, um, we're, we're well endowed when it comes to motorbike lights on this one. <laughs> Good to hear. Uh, Lee, does that mean we're going to have a motorcycle in every show for next year? Yeah, great. Thumbs up, everyone, just so you know. Round the Twist is going to have a motorcycle. <laughs> um, all right, Mike Wilmot, our sound designer. Uh, I mentioned before that this is going to be the hottest playlist in town. Uh, so when you arrive, have Shazam open so that you can grab a whole bunch of songs. Um, but there's... Uh, you have captured a spirit of Vietnam of the time uh, in some really significantly beautiful ways. Can you share that with everyone here? Yeah, it's been an absolute delight, actually. It's kind of been a real Venn diagram of some of my favourite sort of styles of music to begin with. So we've had this mashing of uh, 90s hip-hop from Shane Reddig and the original score for this, and then taking it back to 1975, Motown from America and Country from America, but at the same time found these records from Saigon called the Saigon Sounds Records that are compilations made of Saigon and Vietnamese music right up until 1975. And it is absolutely stunning musicality and beautiful eclecticness of style and where that's come from. And so it's been a real joy to be able to weave those into this story as well. So on top of the hip hop, oh, hip -hop excuse me, <coughs> on top of the hip hop and alongside country and Motown to kind of make a new mega mix tape of the playwright's kind of dream of 
Hay may have mentioned his parents meeting for the first time. Um, the playlist itself, we started with about 150 songs, maybe, and whittled it down, and then it grew again out to about 120, and then it whittled down again. Um, 215, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, we've been working on this playlist since January this year, and it's been a long travel of finding the best selections, really, kind of as a radio DJ could do to trans hopefully transport you back in time and place to 1975 um, through the lens of someone who grew up in the 90s. Yeah. And Mike, the attention to detail is second to none, so amazing work. Um, Nevin, with Nevin Howell, our video designer, continuing this conversation about the historic nature of these events, how has that kind of played into uh, the conversation visually that we're going to see how video plays? Oh, it's, uh, it's yeah, as you know, Ari, um, <laughs> helping me source these images. I think there's about, we've, I've looked through the Australian War Memorial uh, endlessly, finding imagery to use in this show. Um, I think there's about 250 um, Vietnam War images that we are using um, to create a bit of a montage to give um, a lot of the video sequences some pace. Um, you know, I, I guess it's, it's uh, easy to just play a video, but um, to play these images in such rapid succession really gives the audience a qu quite an explosive and different and detailed um, outlook on what the war was like at the time. Um, there'll be moments in play where, you know, a second, and I'm being a bit nerdy, but a second of video content has gone by, and there's 25 frames uh, within a second, but you'll see 25 images of the Vietnam War being played um, in quite like an explosive sort of, yeah, what I think is really cool and different and, you know, uh, visually exciting. Mm. Yeah. And in that second, the impact of every image sits with you. There is some iconic, uh, like, media that you will see from the time, news reels that will be familiar. And Nevin has w woven these together with the ability to have close-up of our actors' faces as well. So bringing that really intimate experience, including this very vast stage. It, it's a beautiful way to kind of bring it all together. Um, <clears throat> oh, I wish Min was here, everybody. Oh, Min Nguyen, if you don't know Min Nguyen, and you're not going to meet him tonight, but hopefully you will at some point, um, you need to know him. He has been our hip-hop consultant, but let me just read out his list of other things that he does. Rapper, producer, streetwear designer, martial artist, MC, radio announcer, podcast host. Um, he has helped uh, the cast shape the raps and their natural kind of flows and finding the rhythms of this work. But in addition to Min, uh, we have had the beautiful Kate Harmon and Gavin Weber from The Farm, which is a Gold Coast-based collective uh, working on movement. I'm going to throw to our directors, can you talk us through some of the movement aspects of this work on their behalf? Thank you. Hello. Are you sure? Um, yeah. Well, Min's amazing, and now I can hip hop. Well, I can rap because of Min. So watch out, everyone. Career pivot. Um, <laughs> album dropping this December. Um, and the farm have been incredible. Gav and Kate um, have been working to give us a choreographic language of the work. Uh, it, the choreography is not as we would normally think of it as a normal conventional dance sequence. They've been working with the actors to elicit a kind of emotional um, choreographic um, stylized language, which has been really, really beautiful, as well as fusing, really kind of working um, to what Mike said, actually, in this kind of, like, mashup of, like, um, hip-hop, um, contemporary dance. Um, there is also some beautiful, like... Um, martial arts moves in there, as well as like some playing with like imagery of war and working from some of the images that Nevin has found and kind of pulling out motifs from that to make, make a choreographic language that, that feels very much its own in terms of Viet Gone. Um, yeah. 
And something that the farm or Kate and Gav do really well is they always look uh, at movement in terms of how is it serving the story. So you'll learn that language from the top of the play and it just echoes through um, and everything just kind of blends into the next so it doesn't feel like here's a musical number. It's, it all has a resonance all the way through and the way that they craft um, the specifics for each scene and what that scene dramatically needs and how their movement has impacted our acting performance has been, it's, it's just been a joy to work with them. Amazing. Um, okay, before we get to the cast, I want to talk about stage management, who are some of our unsung heroes, and they're probably going to hate me for putting a microphone in their hand and speaking. I'm so sorry, Bridget O'Brien is giving me a death evil eyes. Uh, and Yanni Dubla down the end, these are our stage manager and our assistant stage manager. They are our front line. They make everything happen. Um, so my question for the two of you is, uh, what, can you give us an insight into what it takes to uh, realise Viet Gone? There's a big set, there's a cast that are moving and singing, there are multiple costume changes, <laughs> some very iconic costumes, you think like the late 70s, early 80s, there's going to be a bell bottom, a flare, uh, a, a boot, um, but what does it take? Uh, Yanni, we'll start with you and then we'll jump over to Bridget. Um, so, I mean, at the core of my job is being a communicator between, uh, between people and between places. So, uh, I observe rehearsals, I'm in rehearsals at all times, and I make sure that anything that might need to be noted by another person is going to be information that's sent to that person. Uh, that happens in a report at the end of every day. And then on top of that, we are also trying to plan for when we get into the performance, how things are going to run as well. So uh, you could imagine that in a performance situation, I manage everything that you will see and Bridget will manage everything that happens backstage. So we're both just as important as each other because Bridget has to make sure that everything is ready for it to go on stage, for it to be ready for an audience to see. And yeah, we've gone and we've made uh, detailed costume uh, lists of every single costume change in the show and how long people have to get into costumes so that we can know if something needs to be a quick change or something, uh, if an actor has enough time to go back to a dressing room. We've tried to uh, pre-plan as much as possible so that uh, when it gets to this week, which we call Tech Week, everything is as ready as possible um, and just put the information in front of the right people at the right time so that they can go and, and be a star and do whatever they need to do. And that works for our cast, but also for our technical teams. We want to make sure that everyone has the information that they need at the right time so that they can do their jobs to the best of their abilities. Yeah, we'll get quite a big show crew to join us on this one. There's going to be quick changes out the wazoo. Um, <laughs> What's but a technical term. The quickest, everybody. there's something like eight seconds that we're, we're looking at, we're fixing it. Um, but Yanni and I are kind of on board the production from the get-go to be that sort of siphon to different departments. So when we get a wig staff, we get a dresser, we get mechanists, we get other prop handlers backstage, we can kind of build the circus with a plan rather than chaos. Yes. <laughs> we uh, try. The, uh, uh, in earlier weeks, there was a discussion about rissoles <laughs> uh, and the rissoles on stage, which isn't a spoiler, but there will be a rissole. And it will be made with some sort of clay that you won't recognise. <laughs> but there will be plenty of Deb instant mashed potato. Keep your eyes peeled. <laughs> the power of theatre, everybody. <laughs> All right. Um, I'd like to throw over to the cast. Uh, so uh, we're going to start with Hugh Luong. Uh, Hugh, you play the playwright, Queen Nguyen. Correct. What, what does that mean exactly? How... Uh, it's an important role. How, what can you share with our audience tonight about how this character connects us to the story of Viet Gone? I guess Queen uh, Nguyen, the original writer of the play, he, uh, I guess, created a character based on himself to be put into the play to 
I guess, be the glue that holds everything together. And he, I guess, is the storyteller or the narrator in, in play. Um, he does have uh, a few little cameos throughout, uh, hint, hint. And quite an important scene towards the end of the play as well. Um, but I won't sort of spoil anything in, regarding, in regards to that. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, Kui Nguyen um, has kind of exploded in his career. Um, he is now writing for Disney and Marvel. Um, and there's actually a Viet Cong 2 that has been doing the rounds in the States at the moment, um, which you can do further research online. <laughs> um, but it's just ex as exciting um, as the one that you're going to see from us. So maybe you might see Viet Gone to grace the stages here in Australia at some point in the future. <laughs> um, all right, Will and Christy. Uh, you play Quang and Tong, our lovers. Um, what can you share about their journey with us? Christy, please go first. Yeah, go for it. No, Will, you please. Oh. <laughs> All right, that's a, that question's out as well. It is extraterrestrial. Um, look, there are some wonderful aspects in this play that every single person that walks through can take away, uh, which is, it's, it's, it's a very specific type of performance we're producing, but at its core, it's about love eternal, uh, which is something that I feel that we can all very much relate with. Um, we have a meet cute in the play that is unexpected, that evolves throughout the duration, um, I'm just very mindful not to spoil anything. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's definitely something that it's a bonding that has occurred through a very intense emotion that both of them have felt through an event that this story is based on. Um, it's very beautiful to its core. It takes time. It takes um, nourishing and care. But what eventuates is very sweet. Yeah. Um, they start off as very different characters as how they end. And their wants and their needs are completely opposite to each other. But the... Oh, I don't want to spoil. But the, the core of the show, as Will said, is love trumps all. Yeah, yeah beautiful. Yeah. I think this idea of love eternal... Oh, I thought that was Dan grabbing the mic to be like, no, don't say <laughs> um, Love Eternal is present. Yes, this has the backdrop of the fall of Saigon and the war in Vietnam. But as Queen Nguyen uh, wants us all to really think about, this is a love story and where love can take roots anywhere. Um, from there, I'm, I, can we please jump to... Uh, Algin. So, Algin, you play Nan, uh, which is Kwang's best friend. Um, Nan is described as boisterous, loyal, and horny. <laughs> Can you shed any further light on this for us in maybe a bit of a PG capacity? <laughs> um, it says it all, really, doesn't it? <laughs> Uh, no, Nan's a very, uh, uh, very fun character to play um, because I, I feel he brings so much life and energy and joy to the characters that he interacts with, mainly the Quang character here. They, they've known each other for um, a very, very long time um, and they've shared lots of experiences, both uh, heavily traumatic and um, sort of, you know, some of the most... Uh, uh, joyous parts of their lives, and they go through a lot in the in the um, two hours that you see. And in the two hours that you see, uh, you will see that the play sort of time jumps um, quite a bit from uh, Saigon in '68 to Saigon in '75 during the fall of Saigon um, into '75 um, uh, in Arkansas and across Texas and. Um, California and all the way up to 2015. So that's a lot of um, <laughs> that's a lot of life uh, to to experience. Um, uh, what's it like playing Nyan? Uh, it's it's remarkable. I, it's 
I think all the characters, I think it's been, it's been said, but all the characters, this is a very unique um, way to experience and to view a period in time that has often been looked back on, uh, and even in, in, in this country, um, through a very political lens and through a military lens. And it's very rare that you get to hear from a very personal lens of what it was like for people who experienced a period in time that was very difficult um, to go through and what, how, how could you possibly move on um, uh, if you go through that and have to escape a war zone and be plonked suddenly into um, a, a brand new country and how do, you, how do you pick up your life and how do you start again? Um, so uh, all the characters, you know, more or less go through um, uh, their individual journeys and you'll see that because they all are different people and have different, pers different personalities that um, uh, they all go through, they, they all, they all um, yes, they all manifest that through, through, their, own, through their own ways. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. Beautifully said. Uh, I noticed that you covered Boisterous and Loyal and left the other one a little bit <laughs> uh, silent. So you'll just have to see the show to find out the rest of those parts. Um, over to Patrick Janua. Patrick, uh, you play a number of characters. Uh, Zai, Bobby, Captain Chambers, Redneck Biker and Hippie Dude. Which one's the most fun and why? Oh, great question. Ah, oh, they're all so much fun. Um... I would say Bobby's a lot of fun. Bobby carries a lot of heart, um, which first read, first listen, didn't really expect to kind of uncover so much heart in Bobby. Um, yeah, that's just kind of been a really joyous character, full of hope, which I think is always fun to swim in. Um, yeah, so Bobby, I'm really looking forward to sharing. There's a few kind of... Uh, character traits that I really didn't think I'd ever get a chance to portray. I think I can say his accent. Yeah, so Bobby has a southern accent, which is just something that I, I never thought I'd get to do. So just to kind of get the feeling of those, those beautiful southern <laughs> tones in my mouth, that's been really lovely. Um, yeah. Beautiful. Uh, I'm going to jump to Christy from Tong's perspective because Bobby is one of the competing love interests. What's your insight from maybe Tong's world on Bobby? Tong thinks Bobby is really cute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I've started sorry, some Bobby, drama not on me. stage. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, yes. <laughs> I think... She's also, he's the first boy that she meets when she gets to America. And obviously, he's foreign to her. So she finds him very fascinating, finds him very interesting. And she likes the fact that he sort of represents this new world um, in America to her. Um, yeah, she doesn't, okay, she doesn't feel like because of they have a language barrier so it's not like they hit it off straight away but they do have a fondness to each other that they explore a little bit um but then someone else comes along so <laughs> <laughs> and that's where the end of the spoilers are um <laughs> so uh, Redneck biker comes along. <laughs> um, Red as bike. part of uh, the kind of, uh, you're going to hear some, as P J, as Patrick was saying, uh, southern accents. You'll hear uh, beautiful Vietnamese song. Uh, but Dan Evans, there is some uh, the way that our American characters speak is a little bit iconic. Um, could you give us a bit of an insight into? that and the way that Queen Yuen has kind of written uh, how we encounter the Americans inside of this world. 
Mm. Well, what Kui does very cleverly is he puts the shoe on the other foot. And so we um, experience in this play all of um, the Vietnamese characters. Um, we can perfectly understand them. But we, as the audience, cannot understand what the Americans are trying to say. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. yes and that. so all of the American characters speak in catchphrases and idioms like cheeseburger, cheeseburger. NASCAR. Frickles. And Botox. And, yeah, yeah. So there's lots of... Um, so what's beautiful is that that's the way that Kui represents the language barrier. So while everyone on stage can understand each other, the Americans cannot understand the Vietnamese and the Vietnamese cannot understand the Americans. So they kind of... It kind of puts the shoe on the other foot, which is very, very clever. Um, there's some very funny moments um, watching Bobby try to speak <laughs> Vietnamese. <laughs> it's, it's quite great. It's beautiful. Amazing. Okay, uh, we'll jump to not the uh, same question as Patrick. Uh, you play a collection of characters: Asian girl, American girl, to uh, Huang, uh, which is Tong's mum, uh, translator, and flower girl. What's the most fun to play for you? I've got two: okay. Hung, uh, Tong's mother. She's she's quite a, a subtle person. <laughs> Not. Um, she's got a lot of heart, a lot of sass, but she has this wisdom and a, a lot of love to give. Um, and I have to say, Flower Girl, who we've named Dandelion. <laughs> and I like the world that she lives in because it's so far removed from mine. <laughs> but she's very floaty and sensual. But all the characters, sorry. She falls in love with Bridget Chen. And she, oh, yeah. Yeah, she falls in love with, um, with Nyan. <laughs> Beautiful Nyan over there. Mm, if, you're sitting in, if, you're, um, if you're sitting in these seats down here, you're going to have a great show. Let me just say that. <laughs> and oh you're my welcome. Goodness. <laughs> Why is that the same warning that they give to people at SeaWorld? <laughs> Do we need to be worried? That's the splashback zone. Watch out. <laughs> okay, back on track, everybody. <laughs> but, no, I, I want to follow up uh, a question with you. You are working both on stage and off as co-director and as an actor. How has this kind of shaped your journey in each way? Because they are different but intersecting worlds. Mm, that's a big question, Ari Palani. Um, it's it's certainly uh, I've grown. I feel I've grown immensely as an artist. I've 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 always had a profound respect for um, actors and creatives. But this this journey has been quite incredible. And being on the flip side and making big decisions of what you, the audience, will experience and holding a space for the actors, being an actor myself and knowing what, you know, actors would desire in a, a rehearsal room space has been a great opportunity to kind of create a, a good process with Dan. Um, it's, uh, it, yeah, putting on my director hat, then taking it off and then jumping into character, I think, um, like, I feel like a bit of a crazy person. <laughs> um, but if anything, it's, it's really helped clarify what is needed to tell the story um, from a, a, a space that's not just about my performance, but for the, the greater good of what Queen Nguyen has, has written. And that's a that's a big responsibility that I, I take very seriously, um, and I'm just very grateful to be in this position. Yeah. Oh. As a producer, we get to see all of these fine people doing their work. But yes, to honour you all, you are doing so amazingly. This is my one opportunity to say that in front of all of these people. You are crushing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the joy that is at Queensland Theatre, we hear some of the best tunes blasting out of uh, the rehearsal room. We see uh, uh, our cast, who are basically smiles on legs, 
um, wandering the hallways. Uh, and uh, it's tough. They are working hard, but you, bring, you all bring a joy that is infectious and will be infectious throughout the city as well in a positive way. Um, considering that we've just had a pandemic. A choice of words, Ari. Oh, my gosh. Uh, let's backpedal from there. Um, all right. Before we throw over to you, I would like you all to take a moment to start to think about your questions. What are you curious about? What lines of investigation you would like to go down? But I also want to share who's not on stage to bring this to life. Uh, we just spoke about choreography and movement by Kate Harmon and Gavin Weber from The Farm. Our sound system designer, Michael Waters, who will translate uh, the, the system in here uh, into uh, a space that will hold you uh, through all of Mike's beautiful sound design. Uh, we've got cultural safety consultant Katrina Irrawaddy Graham, who worked tirelessly to kind of identify where this work is going to sit inside of our collective spaces and what we need to be mindful of. Uh, the amazing cultural consultant of Uncle Viet Tran, and I really hope that some of you are at opening night or a night where he is, because he is the tiniest, sweetest, most insightful man. Um, he is a radio host for SBS and also on for EB, um, so you might even be hearing him on your radio waves. Uh, we've got Fight and Intimacy Director NJ Price, Voice and Dialect Coach Gabrielle Rogers, Vocal Coach Luke Kennedy, uh, the Landmark Production Fund, which has made this whole thing possible, and of course, the phenomenal Queensland Theatre Departments, particularly production, who is as uh, so I think Bernie was saying that we're in Tech Week, or Yanni was saying we're in Tech Week, um, who are working around the clock. Amazing. A round of applause for all of these wonderful people. <laughs> all right, over to you all now. What questions do we have floating about? And do we have a microphone? Uh, otherwise, I will, yeah. All right, just repeating that. Uh, so for our sound and video folks, uh, researching into the historical events uh, that a lot of our audience are familiar and were around for, um, how has that line of investigation informed your creativity? And we'll go further with the cast of how has that informed where you're at and your approach to this work? Let's start uh, on this side and then we'll go down the other side. Yeah. Um, Brilliant question. Uh, it's affected me immensely doing this project. Uh, there are some things sound-wise, uh, just one example straight away springs to mind that I had no idea about in a historical sense, um, which involves the use of White Christmas by Bing Cosby in the evacuation of the Americans from Saigon at this fall. And the way that's been written to the script is extremely affecting because you get this sense of this clash of a Christmas song against a harrowing devastation and fear. Um, and for the rest of the design too, it's something that going through it is always at the top front of mind of that these sounds and what we're using in this show, people experienced for real, in real life, in real scenarios. And so trying to use them in ways that treat that with this respect of what occurred um, and trying to use it in that contrasting way, never to um, glorify it or put it above, always to make it to put you in the perspective of the people on the ground that are there that may have heard that and that those sounds changed their lives from that point onwards. Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a very personal journey on this work for myself, um, researching into it, finding original sounds and kind of uh, living a history that I didn't know too much about myself. Yeah, <clears throat> it's been a very informative process for me um, you know, going through all of these images and really, you know, taking a moment to soak them in, you know, what was happening at the time. Um, it's big and um, I have a lot of mates who are Vietnamese and I just, yeah, it just gets you a little bit 
you know, uh, a little bit emotional, but um, yeah, it, it, it's good as a designer to be grounded in that history and to um, know that, you know, it's coming from a, a real place, all the, the choices that you're making on stage. Um, but yeah, it's been, been very big, very big. And Nevin has been amazing. He's flagged things saying this might be distressing content. So even any of us who are approaching that, we've been able to know that ahead of time and how we can brief the audiences as well that there may be things that are distressing, but there will be things that will hold you gently as well. This is part of our history. So, yeah, amazing. Um, who else would like to weigh in on this conversation? Cast, help we should, let's throw over to you, Christy. You're uh, oh, not. You're the next one that uh, I see. How has this uh, research and story kind of sat with you? No. Yeah, other way. Um, well, for oh, I, I can speak for myself, and I'm I, I may be able to speak for some of the other cast members who have uh, grown up with. Uh, their, their parents who have experienced the war firsthand. And so I don't want to get too emotional. I might, I may. But, you know, just seeing some of the imagery and delving into the, the nuance and, as Algen said before, really seeing these, these characters as three-dimensional people and not stereotypical and having some agency over their history has been uh, very, it's been a very powerful, uh, if not um, impactful thing. And part of that is, is witnessing the sound, uh, uh, witnessing the, the images that Nevin has so diligently um, looked through and listening to the sounds of not just the music, but, you know, the sounds of, war has been, well, for me, there are moments where I'm caught off guard and it just deepens my connection to, well, it, it deepens my empathy for not just my, my family, but for anyone who's had to go through something so traumatic. Um, yeah, so that's been... Yeah, but uh, what I want to say is how um, how proud I am of this team, knowing that uh, although this is a, a sex comedy, um, we it is, uh, you know, with the backdrop of uh, these historical events that are still quite raw for a lot of people um, and the care that everyone in this team has taken is um, makes the work sore and makes it safe for not just to perform it but to, to witness it in a place where you feel like you're held and you can explore those dark corners and places as well as rejoice and, yeah, with humanity. Beautiful, thank you. Anyone else from the cast? Have you got some insights? Yeah, go on, Hugh. Um, yeah, so I just want to talk about my own uh, individual process and journey with tackling this story. Um, I like to think it's very similar to buying an investment property. You do your background research, you put in the work, and no matter how scary it is, you commit fully. Uh, and so in my own process, sort of researching uh, Kui Nguyen and, and his process in writing this play, um, you know, I've stalked him on Instagram, I watched all of his videos, I got my hands on as many um, articles and YouTube videos as I could just to sort of understand, uh, I guess, his mindset and his reasoning uh, behind wanting to write this play. And I guess that's kind of helped me in embodying Kui himself uh, as, a, as a person and a character. And you'll see, uh, I guess, um, yeah, you'll see that through, uh, I guess, the, the character that I do play and sort of the same sort of energy and um, 
yeah, and really telling the story through Kui Nguyen's eyes as well. Um, that, that's what the playwright is. It, it is uh, basically uh, uh, the character that, that tells the story, but through the eyes of Kui Nguyen and the story of his, his parents um, meeting and to sort of show how important that is to him. Uh, yeah. Tremendous. That's my Thanks, Hugh. Uh, yeah, Christy. And then uh, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. So formulate them and we'll return to you soon. Um, I just want to also say there are so many scenes that represent so many different stories that the Vietnamese people had to go through during the war. And there's one scene... There's one scene where Tong's saying goodbye to her brother and that, as an actor, it's like I'm not just... I'm not... I am just playing, like, my personal stakes as this character, but at the same time there's that voice behind my head saying you're not just telling this one story, you're telling the story of so many people that have all gone through the same experience and that is really special it's like a it's like holding like a pearl that you just have to cherish and nurture and yeah that's all all right if i can just jump it's like i know where i don't want to we i was two seconds yeah. um we're working with a very fragile piece of material uh because it's a very recent event and th there's some people on stage who have been affected the reason i'm here today is because of this event um, and it was very transparent with me from what my parents told me about their relationship with this. Uh, the one thing that I have, like, just to strongly say to you all is that the piece has been taken with a lot of care and respect. From day dot, Dan Knopp and the creative team created a space that made sure that we were safe to express ourselves and also nurtured and evoked emotion from the moment we got in, the amount of care for... Um, the piece was littered against the walls, pictures of the dates that were in the play, as well as locations and whatnot to assist us in finding and developing the characters and the story uh, were absolutely essential. So um, it's a very interesting piece. It's overwhelming at times, not only with the sadness, but also with the joy, but uh, it's been treated with so much respect and care for w what is war. So you really have created a space where we can all fly. So thank you. Um, we'll move to another question. Um, but just to circle back on that, there's a stunning write-up by playwright Chi Wu on the Queensland Theatre website about representation and the history and how this story holds this both gently and boldly. So if you've got 10 minutes with a cup of tea, hop onto the website and check it out. Um, all right, we have a question up the back, yes. So the question, uh, yes, I think uh, uh, congratulations to everyone here um, and also to you all for like being on the journey of this work as well. The question is uh, around marketing and the engagement of young people uh, for a free ticket to Viet Gone for every high school student. Uh, <laughs> And the idea is one Lee Lewis's over to her. Okay, hi. Um, thank you, Ari, but no. I went a little bit rogue last year, and we had the most fabulous board when we decided to bring this to QPAC. Uh, I knew at this time of year, teachers would struggle to get students to come and see it. <laughs> 
it's the crazy end of the year, everybody's doing all these different things. And frankly, Dan, nope, you could back me up on this. There's some material in here, it's handled so beautifully, but it's a little bit of language, it's a little bit of sex, nothing too explicit. But I understand, my mum's a teacher, that it's hard, duty of care-wise, for, for a school to go, yes, we recommend this play. So we decided to go a little bit radical because I think it's really important that students have access to theatre. That once in their life, they could come and see something from Queensland Theatre, uh, find their way to QPAC, show us their student card and sit there and see a wild imagining of a world, a story presented in a way that they couldn't have done by themselves, that really inspires them to think about the value of theatre in their lives. And I thought, this was the play to do it on. And when I pitched the idea to the board, we hadn't costed it at all. It's costing us a fortune. Theatre companies do this around the world, but they generally find a big donor to support it. We just did it. Because sometimes, well, in this time when access for young people to the arts is getting hotter and harder, sometimes the state theatre company has got to wave a big flag and do something that small theatre companies can't afford to do. Uh, yeah. So tell, all, uh, tell every teenager that you know, they can go on the website, sign up for a ticket, they can get themselves to QPAC and come and see an amazing play that is unlike anything else we've ever put on our stage. Uh, if that happens, I am so thrilled. So I think if it, it's a little bit of a problem in, the, in that if too many people come, then we really can't <laughs> afford the play. We haven't figured that out. And, and beautiful executive director Karina Gerke is sitting there going, oh, dear God, I hope this works. Anyway, but, but no, it's in the spirit of wanting our young people to actually have see great work from their state theatre company. Really? Yeah. Amazing. Brilliant. All right. Um, All right, we're going to pass a hat around. <laughs> there is a hat, and it's for our lucky door prize, which we're going to draw in a moment. Um, before we bring things to a close, Dan and Nop, is there any final parting words that you would like to share with our audience before they come to see The Ed Gone? Um, Yes, I want to say that it is um, a bit of a game changer. It's so exciting to work with a cast who get to take up space, have agency over their story, as Nop said. That's really, really exciting. Um, and it's also, I think, what I'm so excited for is the high school students. And I'm so excited for any... Queen Ewan wrote this for his 16-year-old self. And I'm excited that there's about to be a 16-year-old Vietnamese kid in that balcony who might see this and it might just change their life. Um, I'm just excited for everything that Dan just said, but also that this is a, a play where you will need to strap in. It is a roller coaster ride, and it'll catch you at the most surprising moments in the best possible way. And, um, yeah, we can't wait to share it with you. Amazing, thank you. All right, uh, now it's over to game host Ari Polani for our lucky door prizes for this evening. Uh, so we've got three lucky door prizes, everyone rifle around for your raffle tickets. Uh, all of these prizes can be collected, because you might be a winner, can be collected at, our box, uh, at the box office here at QPAC. Uh, you will see one of our marketing representatives in their beautiful Queensland Theatre merchandise shirts. Uh, so you can't miss them. Um, all right. Uh, the first draw for a prize pack from Epic Hair Designs, helping us all look our best. Uh, Bernie, go for it. Can you please draw? Yes. <laughs> all right. And the winner is... C22. C22, it's green, 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 C22. C22, ah, oh, Epic Hair Designs, beautiful, yes. Uh, all right, our second draw, it's a double pass to Christmas, actually. The Music of Love actually live on stage, Wednesday the 13th of December at Brisbane Powerhouse. All right, who's our next one? Yes, let's go, Christina, please. 
And the winner is? It's Purple B75. Purple B75, yes! B75. Welcome, hello! Who's that? Who won? Wonderful. Oh, oh this yes. side of the room Congrats. getting a lot of the love. I want to see that. Let me know if you need a date. <laughs> All right. And our last draw for this evening, a $100 gift voucher to Bacchus Restaurant at Ridges South Bank. <laughs> Temperature's rising. Turn on your humidifiers. What's quang with our nyan? Let's read out together. Ready? Three, two, one. Purple, Purple B100. Purple B100. Hey! Hey! Who won? Where is it? Beautiful. All right. And a reminder that all of these can be... <laughs> all of these can be collected uh, at the box office from one of our wonderful Queensland Theatre representatives. Um, yes, you heard that right. All high school students, uh, they can come and see Viet Gone for free. Uh, tell your high school uh, aged people that they can jump onto the socials and they will find all the links of what to do there. They'll know what to do. Um, and please check out our amazing array of shows for 2024. Season tickets on sale. Subscribe so you don't miss out on everything that next year has to offer. But we are rounding out this year with the wonderful Viet Gone and all of these beautiful people. So let's give it up for them one last time. Thank you much, everyone. We'll see you in the foyer.